today, it is my privilege and honor to bring to you greetings on behalf of the Honorable Minister of State, Ayanna Webster Roy, in the Office of the Prime Minister with responsibility for Gender and Child Affairs, and our Permanent Secretary, Jacqueline Johnson, and my team at the Office of the Prime Minister. It is without a doubt that we are excited about today's proceedings, the Men Roundtable Discussion, where topics such as socialization from boyhood to manhood, men and their emotional self, and wellness will be presented by the experts. This is a great opportunity for our men to learn and increase their own knowledge and understanding about some of these topics and issues that may be affecting them socially and emotionally. You would agree with me that in some instances, some of our men and boys are being stereotyped and discriminated against based on their gender roles in society. Their contributions to the development of Trinidad and Tobago may have gone unnoticed, unappreciated, and undervalued. Today, I wish to encourage all of us as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago to come together and make every effort to eliminate the stereotypes and discriminatory mindset that we have been practicing. It is time that we, that we unite, stand together for the cause. Oftentimes we think that only women have rights, but no, men, boys and girls, we all have rights. This activity today is a testament that the Office of the Prime Minister is promoting gender equality and equity. As we advocate the rights of children and women, so too must we remember the rights of men. As I stand here today and address you, a room full of men, I ask that you become more aware of your own rights your human rights, your rights as a citizen of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. Empower yourself to know your personal rights as a responsibility and rule. So as you know, great power comes from responsibility. That being said, we must acknowledge that the recognition of international days, such as International Women's Day and International Men's Day, is not to appeal to one sex or to create a power struggle among ourselves, as to who is more important. The staff at the Office of the Prime Minister recognizes that all our men, women, girls, and boys are important. You are important to the development and success of our free nation. Without you, we cannot achieve our fullest potential on the global landscape. And it is your responsibility as men, the young and not so young, to not just think of International Men's Day as a day to celebrate, but as one to truly understand and acknowledge what it means to be a man, a mentor, a person. I encourage you to promote good values and healthy lifestyles amongst your peers. As many of you all may know by now, Apart from improving gender roles and establishing gender equality, this year, OPM's main focus has been placed on boys and men and the promotion of health and wellness, both in terms of healthy mindset and healthy living. I implore everyone here today to engage with your, our knowledge banks and make individual attempts to learn more and access the facilities and programs available for your betterment. When you leave here today, you should feel enriched and capable of passing on your new knowledge to your family, friends, colleagues, and community members in order to keep the conversation going. I wish to thank the professors from London South Bank University and the University of the West Indies St. Augustine campus for lending their tremendous support and making every collaborative effort to make this week's activities a success. We have united in media appearances, 
outreach activities and events such as, as this one. Without your support, we would not have been able to touch as many lives or would not have been as successful in attaining feedback from the males in our society. It is my hope that as we continue with today's proceedings and even after the observance of International Men's Day on Sunday, 19 November 2017, that we continue to work to promote and implement improvements in the lifestyles of our men and the society, celebrating the health and well-being of men and boys. I thank you all and trust that you enjoy this evening's event. God bless. Thank you, Mr. Jack Mott. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Sally Hardy, Head of Mental Health and Learning Disabilities, London South Bank University, to say a few words. Welcome and greetings from England, very wet, cold England, to beautiful Trinidad and Tobago sunshine. Greetings to Mrs. Jacqueline Johnson, Permanent Secretary, Office of the Prime Minister, Gender and Child Affairs. Mr. Ian Ramdahin, Permanent Secretary, Office to the Prime Minister, National AIDS Coordinating Committee. Dr. Oscar Ocho, Director of the University of West Indies School of Nursing. Mrs. Antoinette Jack Martin, Director, Office of Prime Minister, Gender and Child Affairs. Panel members and the moderator. We bring greetings from and on behalf of the Dean of the School of Health at London South Bank University and our Vice Chancellor, David Phoenix. We come as part of the Centre of Applied Research in Improvement and Innovation in Health and Social Care. We are so pleased to be working in collaboration with the University of West Indies and very grateful for the support of the Office of the Prime Minister. We believe that the work that we can do together can make a difference to people's lives and we bring expert knowledge in applied research where we engage with communities where they are to inform practice initiatives and services that can improve the health and well-being for all. I've prepared a talk later as part of the round table to discuss more about my own area of expertise in child and adolescent mental health and the mental well-being of our adult population and I look forward to very much learning and continuing to learn more about the health of the nation that is Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hardy. I would now like to invite Dr. Oscar Ocho, Director, University of, School, University of the West Indies, sorry, School of Nursing, to share a few words with us. Dr. Ocho. Okay, so here is Dr. Ocho. <laughs> Since protocols have already been established, we will take it for granted that I don't have to go through the schedule. But I feel very pleased on behalf of my dean, Professor Terence Mungal, and by extension, the principal of the University of the West Indies, Professor Brian Copeland, to say, that as part of the university's thrust with our new strategic 
priorities, bearing in mind we have couched under the triple A strategy, agility, alignment, and accessibility. The University of the West Indies is very conscious of the fact that we must become more engaged with our communities. And this collaboration with Office of the Prime Minister, Division of Genders, as well as our strategic partners, London South Bank University, to my mind, is an excellent tripartite arrangement, if I'm to use a legal uh, labor term, to see how, as a government ministry, we could pool our resources together, both human, technical, financial, and otherwise, and coalesce them in such a way that at the end of the day, the well-being of our society is benefited. We as a faculty are extremely happy to be part of this because we are dealing with a very sensitive issue bearing in mind that we would have read the book Men at Risk but we will also recognize that there are many adjectives to describe us men as endangered species and so on. But this is a testament that we do not hold a fatalistic view of us as men in our society. And we do look forward to the deliberations because we had an excellent forum yesterday. And I can assure you that the Dean looks forward to the outcome of the deliberations. On behalf of Dean again, let me extend the heartfelt welcome. Thank you again, Dr. Ocho. We have now come to the end of this afternoon's formal proceedings. We now move on to the other segment for today's proceedings, the panel discussion. I would like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Jerome Tiloxing, who will steer the discussion. Dr. Jerome Tiloxing has taught at primary and secondary schools. During the past 11 years, he has been a lecturer in the history department at the University of the West Indies. He initiated International Men's Day in November 1999. After witnessing, firstly, too many men being stereotyped, and secondly, the lack of proper male role models for boys. The observances of International Men's Day are part of a global non-violent revolution. This day is annually observed by persons who support the ongoing efforts to improve lives, heal scarred lives, seek solutions to social problems, help the dysfunctional, promote positive role models in society, and develop wholesome individuals. He is also involved in other activism, including promoting Caribbean unity, seeking solutions for poverty, ending unemployment, and eliminating racial and religious discrimination. So I'd like to invite to the podium Dr. Jerome Tiloxing, who will be our moderator for this afternoon's proceedings. Thank you very much, Mr. Kujo, for that introduction of me. And I just want to say that I really appreciate the comments from the previous speakers. You know, I fully endorse what you all have said, and I'm really glad to see that International Men's Day has reached this height, has reached this height in Trinidad and Tobago. I want to introduce the panel members briefly and tell you where they are attached. And as I say their names, they could come up and join me up here at the podium. The first panelist is Professor Sally Hardy from London South Bank University. You all heard her just now. She'll be speaking on men and emotional well-being. The second panelist is Mr. Kern Tyson, 
and he will be speaking on men and adversity. The third panelist is Dr. Gerard Hutchinson, professor of psychiatry, and he will be speaking on masculinity, pain, and negotiation of wellness. He didn't reach out? All right, okay, good. So we'll wait for him. And the fourth panelist, Mr. Amilka Sinclair from the University of the West Indies, will speak on the socialization from boyhood to manhood. And the final panelist, Permanent Secretary Ian Ramdin of the Office of the Prime Minister, National AIDS Coordinating Committee. And Mr. Ramdin will speak on the importance of sport in shaping a man's character. The panelists will have 10 minutes each to make their presentation. And then we will have you know, comments from the audience. So I want to invite the first speaker, Professor Sally Hardy, and we'll, as when Professor Hutchinson comes, he will join us up here. So thank you for get, again for the invitation to speak at the round table. You may be wondering, who is this white, menopausal woman and what has she got to say about men and boys health particularly their mental health well if I can just take a few minutes of your time to explain myself I've worked in England and Australia in the health care services training as a nurse first in adult care and then specializing in mental health and I've undertaken a considerable amount of research into men's health and children and adolescent mental health. My focus is always about creating an environment where people can flourish. Whether you are a healthcare professional, an informal carer, or yourself suffering and in need of professional intervention. My focus is on recovery and promoting well-being, working with clinical teams, individuals, their families, loved ones, and whole communities. I've worked with the Department of Health in England on the integration of physical and mental health as an important political goal. As Lewis Wolpert, the developmental writer, says, we're beginning to put the head back on the body. One of the initiatives that I worked with was called No Health Without Mental Health. And invariably, you will hear me saying, so what about mental health? In preparing for today, I was looking for information about the mental wealth, health and well-being of Trinidad and Tobago men and boys. What I found was a World Health Authority report from 2006. Our own research that we've been undertaking while we've been here has also revealed that men consider a healthy man to be what I call three-dimensional, to be concerned about their physical well-being, being physically fit, their mental ability to cope, make decisions, and connect with their families and their communities, and thirdly, the spiritual element of understanding their connection with a bigger world and the world within which they live. So Trinidad and Tobago's mental health aims to ensure that men and boys have the ability to manage and deal with the everyday issues they come across. They make informed choices about how they connect with and, sol and find solutions to personal, social, family problems. And that they also are able to share and adhere to the conventions of their community through behavioral standards and expectations. When it comes to psychiatric disorders, there are considered mild and moderate elements of depression and anxiety, they're not necessarily seen as a mental health problem. 
In our conversations today and yesterday, a lot of the men are very willing to talk about and share their story with you as a woman, but also with their fellow men. The concept of mental illness is attributed to psychiatric disorders and treatment is often seen as and understood as very medicalized, often leading to inpatient institutionalized care. We're seeing globally that mental health is becoming as big a burden as cancer and heart disease. People are living longer and having more complicated health and psychological well-being needs. For our children and young people, we are also finding that they are seeking help and also demanding specialist care and treatment from a very early age. It is alleged that a child in the United States was diagnosed with personality disorder at the age of two. The stigma that surrounds mental health and psychiatric disorders is again a global phenomenon. At London South Bank University, we have created a massive open online course that offers anyone free access to six weeks of information that follows a video of a patient's journey through a mental health collapse and recovery. We see how she is able to interact with the healthcare services, but we also see the impact of her deterioration on her family. We are engaging with people across the world through the MOOC, and we are finding that the six weeks exposure is having a difference on their understanding and their attitudes to mental health and the ability for people to recover. So going back to what is happening in Trinidad and Tobago, I came across a term like father, like son, and there is a huge amount of emphasis on the men's role in productivity, success, wealth, and an ability to provide. One of my PhD students has recently done some work looking at how children and adolescents talk about and where they think their mental health issues have come from. I think this is the same for men as it is for boys. There is a high level of concern about being judged by others, whether it's your peers, society, family members, in the workplace, the ability to produce and be and reproduce. There are still elements of stigma, shame, and the need to have stamina and a high social status to remain mentally well. Men and boys are also concerned about seeking and being helped. Is it okay to say, I don't feel I am coping as a man or as a young boy? There is high level of emotional stress and trauma as more and more of our children are seeking professional help for very early elements and exposure to abuse, trauma, crime and violence. One of the key areas that continues to fascinate me is about who am I? Who is self? And being me is a core element of mental well-being. Today, our young people are very conscious of what they look like, their physique, their gender identity, their spirituality, all affects their self-confidence, their ability to make decisions, and their emotional intelligence. And then there is this complicated concept of being a man and the rites of passage that the young boys have to go through. The, the enormous pressure on gangs and being part of your peer group, accepted, understood. As you probably know, every minute a man dies around the world through suicide. Men are 10 times higher at being successful at 
suicidal behaviors than women, and we know that men tend to choose more violent means of harming themselves, reaching a successful conclusion to suicide. In England, we've seen a massive rise in the student population seeking professional counseling services and the high pressure they are under to gain good degrees and good jobs. We are aware that the first thousand days of a child's development can have huge impact on their psychological well-being and their health profile. As we learn more and more about neurological developments and advancements, we know again that the baby's rear part of the brain is formalized through their early interactions. So what can we do and what does mental well-being, do you see what I did there? In next slide. <laughs> so for me, mental well-being is about talking it's not about telling someone what to do, it's about listening. And again, I, I have been told that God gave us two ears for a reason and only one mouth. It's about sport, it's about activity, physically keeping yourself active, not sitting around. And again, my colleague Jane has done research about obesity in childhood, largely because children are not moving and the impact that has on their self-worth, self-image. It's about being proactive, not reactive. Contributing, not just complaining. Collaborating, not colluding. Supporting, not succumbing to stress. Challenging each other, but not criticizing. Embracing difference, not embarrassing. About being brave enough to have the courage to say I need help not the shame of being seen as soft. And it's about m improving mental well-being together and understanding that you are not alone. One in three people suffers from mental health problems. And as we heard earlier in the greetings, I hope today we keep the conversation going to enable all of us to flourish together, whether male or female. Thank you. Thanks very much, Professor Hardy. And the next speaker is Mr. Kun Tai Sinan. I help him to the podium. Thank you so much. Good afternoon to everybody. All protocols being observed mercifully. <laughs> Not sure if I'll be able to run through all those names if I had to. But it's indeed a pleasure to be here. And my topic this afternoon is men and adversity. I'm wondering if it's um, if they chose someone who is visually impaired to speak about adversity because <laughs> I guess I understand what adversity is being born visually impaired and my mother having to drum certain things into me she certainly taught me from an early age how to deal with adversity that adversity though tough as it is is more of a friend than an enemy now forgive me this evening this afternoon i'm very preachy I'm not the kind of person to really be very, very quiet. I'm very expressive. I'm very loud. I'm an avid sports fan. I'm a sports journalist. I'm the CEO of my own company, Sports on the Wood, which is a radio station designed to push sports and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what I do. Um, let me tell you a bit about myself, first of all. As I mentioned before, I was born in 1978, visually impaired. And my mother took me to different doctors, not understanding what was going on with my eyes. Someone told my, told my mother, listen, he's brain damaged. <laughs> Someone told my mother, well, um, nothing is wrong with his eyes. Someone said he had glaucoma. And my mother from an early age began to tell me, listen, yes, you are blind, 
but you are normal. Yes, you are blind, but you are exceptional. And my mother began to read the dictionary to me every day. Began to read. Pushed me to speak properly. Not because you're blind, it means you can't speak properly. And she began to push me. Push me through primary school. Push me through secondary school. Caused me to get a full certificate. Certificate at CXC level. Caused me to go on to do A-levels. Pushed me to start my degree. So she taught me from an early age the importance of embracing adversity, not running away from it. Who's going to take the last shot? Five seconds to go on the clock. Your team is down by two. The ball is in your hands. And 20,000 people looking at you, wondering what on earth are you going to do with this ball? Are you going to shoot it? Are you going to take responsibility and shoot the ball? And then you shoot the ball and you score. My mother taught me very, very early in life the importance of shooting the ball, the importance of making it count, the importance of trying something, and even if you fail at it, you try at it again. But what about the other men who weren't taught of, about how to deal with adversity, how to deal with trouble? We were told from an early age we need to man up. Anybody ever heard that before? As men? So, for example, the young, a, a, a girl would fall and hurt herself and she'll cry on the ground. If we fall, we have to pick ourselves up and bite our lips and don't cry because, you know, boys don't really cry, you know. So we are told to man up. But how do we actually man up? Trouble comes and you find gentlemen running off to the, their, their water in holes, running away from trouble. Because trouble is something that is very tough to deal with. Is that true? It's not something that we want to run into. Adversity is something that you want to, okay, um, this is a new opportunity. We run away from adversity. It is not something that is pretty, very easy to deal with. So how, as men in the 21st century, do we deal with adversity, deal with the vicissitudes of life? How do you deal with it? In 2012, my wife had a massive stroke, and I had to deal. I couldn't sit in the corner and cry. I had to deal with my business as a man. Nobody really care about you being a blind man. You're a man, you have to deal. You have to go to the hospital and speak to the doctors, and they're looking at you like, who is you, blind? You have to deal with the issues, but how do we deal with it? And, and, and that is where I'm going today. How do I deal with adversity? How do we teach this generation of young men to deal with their troubles, to deal with their issues, to deal with their failures, to deal with, uh, I don't know, their dreams and failing? How do you deal? I thought about it, and I'm thinking if I had a son, if I had to mentor a young man, what would I tell him about adversity? I'll tell him this. That adversity is an opportunity for you to succeed. I would tell him that adversity and trouble is like pressing on grapes and olives. Squeezing. Opportunity brings out the best in you. That is what it was designed to do. Bring out the best in you. It's only when you are squeezed, it's only when you are pressured, the good things come out or the bad things. So somebody would tell you, pressure will, pressure will bust by. But pressure would also make diamonds. Pressure would squeeze the grapes out, the juice out of the grapes and make it into wine. Pressure would squeeze the oil out of the olive. That's what pressure would do. Pressure brings the best out of you. Michael Jordan thrived on pressure. Brian Lara thrived on pressure. Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Usain Bolt. That's what I would tell him first of all, that pressure and adversity is an it's an opportunity for you to soar. And the same thing that was designed to break you is designed to actually to build you. Use it to build you.
I will tell my son the importance of being relentless in life. Not giving up on your dream even when everybody else has given up on it. Not giving up on your family. Not giving up, but pursuing. I remember Arthur Bolden in 1997. He was the favorite to win the 100 meter goal at the World Track and Field Championships in Greece. And he failed, came fifth. And there was gut-wrenching disappointment. And Brian Lara called him and said, Atto, forget about that race. Look ahead to the 200 meters. And he won it five days later. The importance of being relentless, the importance of pursuing whatever you have to pursue in spite of the obstacles in front of you. I will teach him to be relentless, not giving up like my mother taught me to be relentless. A little blind guy with a silly dream of being a sports journalist. Can't even see a cover drive, can't even see Rainy Rooney kicking the ball into the net and you want to cover sports? Are you out of your mind? Is something wrong with you? Blind people don't cover sports. Why don't you do something else that's simple? And I decided not to. I decided to pursue my dream. That was adversity. I'll teach my son to be resilient. The importance of bouncing back after a storm, after trouble. What do you do when you, are, when you are hit and you fall? When life hits your left-right combination and you fall on the ground, flat on your back, on the mat, and everybody's looking at you thinking, are you going to get up or are you going to stay down? And they begin to count you out. One, two, three, four. What do you do when you're down? You get back up. We have to teach our young men to get up after a fall. Nothing is wrong with falling down. It doesn't mean that you're weak. What do you do after the fall? The importance is to get up after the fall. And that's one thing my, 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 my mother taught me. One thing my father taught me. The importance of getting up. Going back on the bike again. Going back on the roller skates again. Trying it one more time. The importance of bouncing back in life. And the last thing. One of my favorites is really to... I'll teach if I had a son. And if I have a, someone to mentor I would tell him the importance of rising above the storms of life. I heard this story a few years ago about this donkey falling into a hole. This large hole fell flat down. And the farmer looked down and saw the donkey on the ground, deep down in the hole, thinking he's going to die. And he began to shovel down dirt on the donkey. And as he shoveled down the dirt, the donkey, donkey jumped and shook it off. And before you know it, he came out of the hole. The importance of rising above the storms of life. That's what we must teach men. The importance of using adversity as a ladder. The same thing that was designed to crush you and to break you. Use it as a ladder to get out. That's what I learned in life. And I stand here as a testament of God's goodness because I still have to be relentless. I still have to be resilient. I still have to rise above the storms of life. And if I could do it, you could do it too. God bless you. very much Kern. Um, being a moderator is a very difficult job. You know, I have to you have such you hear such good testimonies and presentations and you have to limit them. And I also want to mention to Kern and uh, Mr. Ramden that one of the reasons I chose November the nineteenth and Kern will know this and, and Mr. Ramden was on the nineteenth of November nineteen eighty nine the strike squad lost to United States 1-0. We cried. And 
The National Stadium was filled, but the, the months and the weeks prior to that event, we were all united, you know. We had transcended religious, ethnic, cultural, geographic, gender, class barriers. And we were all one. We were back in that strike squad no matter what. And I always felt that that day, November the 19th, should be remembered. And I wish we could have repeated that day every day, 365 days. Because Trinidad and Tobago was one. We were united. You know, so it's very, very interesting that uh, Kuhn shared that testimony on sport. And I know Mr. Ramdain will also touch on sport. I want to invite Professor Hutchinson to the podium now to speak on his topic on pain. Thank you, Jerome. Good afternoon, everybody. All protocols observed. Um, my uh, topic selected was masculinity and pain. And as a psychiatrist and a, a, a teacher at university, I thought I would look at that through uh, the health dimension particularly, and in some ways to follow up on <clears throat> what Professor Hardy was talking about, as well as the, the, the social implications of that. So internationally and across all countries with the exception of China, men live shorter lives than women. Uh, life expectancy, which is the number of years one would be expected to live given um, an equal playing field, is five to six years greater in women than in men. And as I said, that applies across the world. In Trinidad and Tobago, it's about six years. Men the life expectancy of men is about 68 years and of women is about 74 years. One of the reasons that have been put forward to explain this is that men engage in more risk-taking behavior. That is to say that they drink more, they smoke more, they get in more accidents. And as uh, Professor Hardy said, they also kill themselves more. And over the last 20, 25 years, we've seen this incredible upsurge in violent death, such that violence, injuries, and accidents are the greatest cause of death in the 15 to 44 age group in the Caribbean and Latin America, and makes us unique to some extent in that regard. And of course, a lot of that violence, as we would see from reading the papers, comes out of um, interpersonal violence and the and you could you could tell or you could see from the the stats that are presented that the homicide rates are much greater to the extent of maybe eight or nine to one for men versus women. Same applies to suicide, the same applies to death through accidents. So the question is why is it that men engage in, in, in this risk taking behavior? We've also found, also seen, that premature mortality is predicted by behaviors like drinking and smoking. And again, men are much more likely to engage in those behaviors and also engage in them in a way that is detrimental to their health. So these things are things that we know. These are things that have been found. But what about things that are within or more directly within their control. Another interesting statistic is that when you look at clinic attendance for chronic diseases like diabetes and high blood pressure, again, women are far more likely to attend clinics, and men only tend to go to clinics, only tend to attend to their health when complications have occurred. And of course, that means when the disease has progressed to a point where it's much more difficult to control. So you find, again, that premature mortality is informed by that. And I think that those are health consequences of the, some of the things that, that the previous speaker mentioned. The idea that men should not express vulnerability, that they should not appear weak, and they should not appear uh, as if they need help, and they should act as if everything is okay when in fact everything isn't. 
I think another significant factor that is influencing the way men see themselves is what has happened to women over the last 30 or 40 years. In the medical school, for example, where I work, when I first started teaching there in 2002, the male to female um, percentages were 70 to 30, so there were 70% males and 30% females. Now in 2017, that uh, ratio has completely reversed, and we have, in fact, 75% females to 25% males. So when you look at the, the uh, academic success at Common Entrance, so SEA, sorry, and the um, CSEC and CAPE, again, you see a predominance of females. So what is happening uh, to our males? Why is it that these um, these, these statistics suggest that males are struggling compared to females. And again, I don't know that there are any final answers to that, but certainly in the developmental cycle, it does seem as if men are, or boys are suffering more. Uh, is it a question of the absence of role models, as some have suggested? Is it that their mothers themselves, because their mothers are now um, themselves working and, and developing themselves academically and in other ways, that the relationships that they had with their mothers that previously obtained, again, the previous speaker talked about how his mother inspired him, um, are these now, are these relationships now in some way negatively affected and is affecting how boys are seeing themselves? Is it that that question of identity and belonging is becoming uh, less clear to them and they're, they're, they're drifting, trying to find uh, places to belong? And is this why they're joining gangs and why they're engaging in, in territorial type violence where the gangs defend turf and defend, defend space? Um, and I think we have, to, we, we, we have to find answers to those questions. Because from where I sit, I think that they are definitely the, the predictions that Dr. Miller had, had um, proposed several years ago with his men at risk work, I think are, are coming to pass. And I don't think society as a whole has really seriously attempted to address the, the difficulties that, that, that boys and men face. And I think that we see it in terms of mental health and the kinds of mental health problems they present with, um, the, the, they are overrepresented in things like uh, psychotic illnesses as compared to women. And, and in psychotic illness, the uh, psychotic illness refers to people who have difficulties engaging with reality, so they, they, they have strange perceptions and, and beliefs that are deluded that in turn affect their behavior. They also represented, as I said, in, in substance abuse across, across all the substances. And I think that those, those problems are really a part of the whole developmental struggle that men face in terms of coming to terms with themselves. And I think the services have not um, been able to adjust or been able to address these changes in a way that, um, that, that has benefited men. And of course, in addition, the, the, the wider changes in terms of social media and um, the so-called information age, the age of emotional intelligence, I think women have uh, more perhaps naturally predisposed to engage in the tasks that are demanded by this age compared to men. And I think that we haven't been able to engage our men and boys in a way that would help them to do that. Another disturbing statistic that we see here is murder-suicide. And on average, we have uh, five murder-suicides in Trinidad per year. And most of them are perpetrated by men killing their spouses or their partners and then um, killing themselves afterwards. 
And I think that's a symbol of the, the, the difficulty that they face. And I think one of the, the tasks we have is to help men adapt to the demands of the new world and to help them see themselves in a way that would allow them to find a place that would um, allow them the capacity to fulfill their potential, to overcome adversity in the way that the previous speaker described, and to see themselves as part of a future that includes them. Because I think that the fear among them is that they're becoming increasingly marginal, marginalized, especially as in many instances now, women are working and in some cases earning more than their partners. And I think men are struggling to cope with this. What is needed is, I think, a, a deeper engagement so that we can understand why all of the things I've discussed are occurring and, as I said, to devise strategies to better deal with it. Thank you. much, Professor. And the next speaker is Amilka from UV, and um, his presentation will deal about socialization, something very relevant to Trinidad and Tobago today. Thank you very much, Dr. Tilok Singh. But I'll have to take this opportunity to reintroduce myself. My name is Amilka Sanatan. And first, I'm a student. Second, I've been blessed with the opportunity to teach a number of gender studies courses, one being men and masculinities in the Caribbean. And when I don't have on my Batman cape at night, I write poetry and do creative writing. So as part of a collection of essays, I'm working on tentatively titled A City for Small Men and Big Boys. I'll examine what those transitions between boyhood and manhood look like. In Trinidad and Tobago, many of us are familiar with the words bad man, red man, black man, Indian man, high man, piper man in the area. And there's a set of words that we create for I think two categories where we fall into primarily, which is the small man and the big boy. So the ambition of a young person, a young boy, oftentimes is to be a man in waiting. So that is why you say small man, get that thing for me. And then a big boy is somebody who occupies his status, power, and control over other people. And this is an essay I've produced titled Disappearing Boys. I hated Mr. Griffith, math teacher who beat half the class one morning with a bamboo whip since half the class did not do their homework. We spent half the class period getting our asses cut and half the time learning Pythagoras theorem. To be honest, I hated him but only half the time. My parents never hit me and to think that this arbitrary man did fire burn him. Nevertheless, I enjoyed his stories about Eric Williams and the aspirations of an older generation to salute a new national flag. He was a walking encyclopedia, but the threat of licks was ever present. One day we turned that fear against our teachers, that day when Lynn jump kicked Mr. Casaborn in his chest. I never had the courage to do such a thing. Most of us did, but not. We didn't have the courage to kick him, so we knew Lynn kicked him for all of us. All teachers took notice. All the boys took notice of Lynn in mid-flight with a jump kick like Bruce Lee. We took notice of his security guards escorting him and the principal with his hand wringing his uniform chokingly around his neck. He was a man among us, but the reality is that we were all not Lynn. Lynn was expelled. Men cannot sit in a classroom of boys. I never saw him again. Jesse Eiton is dead. His father was a big boy in the university, and he was a big boy in university's primary school. He was so cool for school. He was good at everything, mathematics, swimming, football, and getting the girls. But he had to make it look easy. He had to talk back to teachers, turn his crew of friends into the ultimate gang, because nothing he was good at made him any more of a man. And I understood it and used to look up to him, waiting on my turn to be the big boy too. I wish I had more years to watch him. 
It was as if his life was set out, everything before him. He was head of the pack of boys. He was a big boy at 11 years old, but his body was still that of a growing child. And one afternoon, he walked out of a maxi to meet his father and a driver on the bus route, speeding, crashed into his teenage body with no regard to his size. The meaning of Jesse Eiton to all the other boys, the epitome of cool, meant nothing. When the iron of that front bumper broke into his bones, they killed the figure of the boy who saw his life as a made man. I saw him that way. I could not sleep for nights. I had to go to the place where the killing happened because unlike the press, I could not call the wasting and disappearing of boys an accident. His mother still prays for him and in true big boy fashion, his grave is stationed in the university's burial ground. My brother went too soon. We were tired of the advantage teachers had, old men who could hit us while they executed their strokes, lecturing us about our failure to be men, reminding us we were little boys, always less than a man. I always knew we could never be men in their eyes. For us, being flogged in front of the class or on assembly line was a sort of ritual too. Whatever the teachers thought did not matter. We measured our manhood by our numbness to the strokes. Part of the act of being a man was showing you could take it, take all your licks like a man, showing it never hurt, or that you clung around, jumping and prancing, dancing, smiling in the process to trivialize it. One student, a little boy, Amit, he desperately begged not to be hit, and he cried when he was struck. He dropped under the table crying, the only place he could hide. Then the oversized Griffith drew him by his belt and delivered seven strokes onto his crumbling body. And we laughed at him in the chorus for the whole period, hands on mouths, hands on our stomachs, swallowing the context, rocking back and forth like a car pulling brakes in staccato. Our laughter was a second punishment. We laughed because he could not take the licks like us. With stoic silence, he was not yet a man. The violence that surrounded us was not separate from us. In the second week of the third term, I found a gun in the dustbin. Before I could put the lid back on its head, I was informed about whom the gun belonged to, who was born in it, and who was the intended target. I nearly pissed myself at the discovery. I kept all that together with a broad smile, laughing it off. When nonsense happened, I learned to act normal. I had to pretend this was not a surprise to me, and this was part of the ordinary. Griffith said that Eric Williams was sure that the future of the nation was in our book bags. Our book bags were expensive and brand name. The textbooks in fresh condition because we never read them. And our futures were empty. And I did not want my future to be wasted in the barrel of a gun or a dustbin. I knew better, and a gunman was not the big boy I wanted to be. No one planned to shoot another student in school uniform. There was an unspoken code that protected against this. Guns were a way of ending all the gun talk. A gun humbled an overconfident small man into a little boy. I don't know if this code is still alive. Now schoolboys are murdered. Their uniforms are full of permanent red marker condolences from friends gone too soon instead of graduated. We were so angry, and the media, our parents, our teachers, our leaders, our elders did not know what to do with us. A six-year-old boy in second year class Waterloo Hindu Primary School was found dead 300 feet away from his home. He was not the only one dead. They murdered his manhood, then killed him. He was buggered. He was sexually assaulted forcibly with a cane stalk. The perpetrators were also young boys, one 14 and the other 16. I had not heard the news until later that night. I vividly remember seeing the car lights, full beam in daylight traffic, a kind of solidarity statement manufacturing light in these dark times. Oh, come on, doctor, come in. Happen up. Noises happen in these moments. Noises that it was people from Lavantil, meaning black boys were responsible. Noises about Satan's reign on our island and an end time nearing. Noises about homosexuality and a generation lost to fire and brimstone. There were noises on top of noises. The school system fails us, police fail us, and community exists no more. But these were little boys. Little boys are disposable because their death does the rest of society a favor. That is why no one wants to be small or stay small in my city. When you disappear, little is missed. But this was not the first time we had reason to be in outrage. We still don't have justice for little Akil Chambers, a victim of the big boys. And that noise about his violation and murder is drowned underwater. And I begin to close here. 
Many of us began drinking. We saw our fathers do it. It became natural for men to populate rum shops and habits begun in school. There is a myth that goes, we drink our troubles away. No, we are away when we drink, away from our families, away from our loved ones and even ourselves. The alcohol is a vehicle that takes us from a life we think is troubling to another place whose dangers we are yet to call by name. So many of us were angry, still angry. We never really talked about it. We fought, hit back, hit guns and bins, laughed hard till our stomachs burst. But if anything was meant to be innocent and just in the life of a boy, that disappeared. Thank you. Very much, Amilka, and we all know how powerful the spoken word is. Eh? Many of these young people use that, and members of the London South Bank University will, will know the name V.S. Naipaul. Right? So you've seen some of the talent we have here in Trinidad and Tobago, using words to express some of the problems we have here in this country and the re-socialization that is needed for our young people. So very good, Amilka. We have some really powerful presentations, and I'm sure the questions and answers after will also open this discussion some more. So I want to invite the Permanent Secretary in the Office of the Prime Minister to come and continue the discussion on sport. Good afternoon everyone, or political observe. Basically, um, I'm an engineer by background, right? My journey in public service, um, 18 years spent in the Ministry of Energy three and a half years spent in the Ministry of Sport, but I'm not really um, a sociologist or a sport expert. But what I'm here to do is to deliver to you, basically, my personal journey. You know, how, how did sport become a factor in my life, right? And I can tell you back in the days when I was growing up, my mother wanted to you know, confine me to the books and be like my cousin because they're reading the, all these novels and, and I only want to play on the outside, you know? It so happened back uh, when I was 11 years when we were writing, you know, um, was, they were coming entrance. And we, we had to um, do the exams, um, well, evening classes. I had to walk home, but nobody to pick you up from school, so we had to take a taxi and go home. And walking home now, I didn't realize they were walking a mile. And went up in secondary school now. To my surprise, when I started participating in sports, I, I was running faster than everybody. I was winning all my races, right? It came a point in time I was running against Form 6 and I beat only Form 6, yeah? So I was a kind of anomaly, the fastest Indian, right? In, in, in presentation, check on us, right? So I realized something, I had a moment of self-discovery, right? And this is what you all have to look for. That's help the youths, help those young men find, <coughs> self-discover themselves, right? And I realized basically, I develop a love for sport, but also because I, you know, basically love to be challenged, and the thrill of the hunt, you know. We hear about men back in the, the days, dinosaurs, you know, the hunting, providing food for the animals, the thrill of the hunt. Well, I'm, I'm basically probably that type, you know. And that, that thrill of the hunt, you know, that, that basically carried me throughout my career. Because when I entered in, in Ministry of Energy, I realized that, wait a minute, this place needed leadership, it needed guidance, so I had to pull everybody together and help them move through, right? And ultimately, that's before I left Manager of Energy, we were rated the top three institution in the public service because of that bonding, right? And we had more meals at that time, and we had more meal bonding, right? Networking, aligning, socializing, if you want to call it, right? So basically, sports has a, has a role to play, right? And you ask yourself, what's happening to the society today? Why it is we don't have any Indian males in any football team? You see them in cricket, yeah, but you don't see them watch all the place. And many of them bashful and shy, you know, they, they, you know, they compete and lose and, and you know, you, you see very few, right? So, uh, apart from cricket, right, um, you know, there, there are a lot of talented young males out there. And sport, sport basically is that avenue where we could come right and we could basically bond a network and what, what sport does right it gives you that um it promotes your your apart from your well-being you know uh, it also leaves a better quality of life okay 
So you, you look at the, the, the impact of sports, right? You have the physical benefits in terms of it, it, it basically help maintain uh, healthy, you know, your health, and in terms of combating all these um, diseases like the non communicable diseases, um, heart disease, cholesterol, right? Control the blood pressure. It leads to healthy organs, um, bone, you know, bone development. Right? It helps us control our weight, um, energy levels, right? And also um, to sleep, right? On the mental side, um, it, it helps us because um, it's a way to release stress, right? So if you, you, you have anxiety, you, you, you take a lap around the savannah, you, you burn it out, distress yourself, right? So it's a stress reliever, right? It brings a sense of calm, you know, when, when even yoga is sports, right? Um, you know, all these, um, you have basically combative sports, you, you, you have the non-strenuous sports, okay? And it, it contributes to the self-esteem of the, the, the individual, right? And most importantly, it, 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 I would say that by promoting self-esteem, it helps combat depression, okay? On the social side, I think the impact is the greatest on the social side. Because with sport, you have this bonding that takes place. You make friends, right? By competing against um, your other colleagues, you, no matter if you lose or win, you know, you build that friendship, right? And this is what society is missing today. Youths not networking, right? They're this combative mode and they're not networking and, and bonding, right? Um, it helps you to have fun, right? Something like laugh, you know. Um, people, you know, looking at the young children today, they, they, they grew up in this, this um, oppressive society. Um, you know, mother and father is probably not working and, and you know, be, being happy. Because everybody's goal in life, you know, they want to be happy, right? And sports provide that happiness, happiness to you. No matter if you take a, if you take a, a coconut branch and a, a small little stone or a thing and you play cricket on the road, it, it, you, you see the smiles on your own face, right? And it, it ends um, um, stigma and discrimination, right? It combats, um, that's a mental problem because when, when you're discriminated, you, 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 you retract, right? Um, sports also help in family bonding because when, when you have a father, a brother, or a, uh, son, you know, um, you, you, you basically, everybody going out to exercise, taking a walk in the park, right? It, it builds that family relationship. And it also uh, provides career path because a lot of coaches, we have a lot of male coaches, it provides the opportunity for, for employment, right? So I, I would say um, basically, we have all these beautiful sport facilities, the Ministry of Sport, right, um, in the um, local government. We have grounds, we have uh, pools, we have indoor sporting arena, we have the big new mega facilities. Um, utilization is an issue, you know, they're getting people to come out and utilize them. Um, I know security is a big issue when you come out in night, you know, you don't want to get robbed or mugged. And, and, and we, we face with this challenge of coming to work every morning. Some of us taking three hours traffic to come to Port of Spain three hours back. Where are we getting time to exercise, right? A lot of meal, um, you know, um, when I look at my journey, coming from you to, to this um, PS level. I really never wanted to be a PS. I just came through the, the, the um, Rudy exam came up, right? But, you know, having seen, seen the other side, you know, I kind of like it doing the social aspect of the work, right? But you, you, you find yourself bogged down, basically, you know, doing all this work, sitting at you, sometimes sitting at you behind a chair for eight hours, right? I tell myself I can't do this. I had to get out lunchtime, take a stroll and put a spin. It takes me about an hour to go and come back just to have my legs moving, you know, exercise, because feet is probably the most important part of your body that keeps your health and well-being intact, right? So I'd like to urge all the um, men in Trinidad and Tobago to, to basically try to utilize the sport facilities, because the government has done a great job in providing all these beautiful sport facilities. Try to utilize them. And um, I'd like to wish everybody a, um, well, a happy International Men's Day. And I can thank P.S. Johnson for taking initiative to, to basically push for this um, program. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Ramdane. Um, before I introduce the facilitator for this evening, I want to invite um, two, Dr. Sykes and Dr. Wills, Professor Wills, right, and Dr. Sykes. Um, 
to the podium to speak to you all about the research component that have been um, undergoing since yesterday. Right? You would see these various papers on your seats and you're probably wondering what they are there for. Thank you very much. Um, on International Men's Day, we mean, need to remember that men are negatively affected by gender inequality. In education, in mental health, as we've heard, and in life expectancy and premature death. And we know that in Trinidad and Tobago, there are very specific issues. We've heard about interpersonal violence, about high rates of diabetes, and high rates of prostate cancer amongst the highest in the world. So we need to address the determinants of this inequality in health and ill health. And many of those determinants are cultural and social. They impact on the protective health behaviors that men may or may not adopt, and their help-seeking behaviors. So our research collaboration from London South Bank and with the University of the West Indies is there to try to explore how notions of maleness and masculinity influence men's help-seeking help behavior and how we best promote public health messages to men, including going for a walk. So just briefly what we've done in the last few days whilst here. We asked a lot of men yesterday in a forum, over 150 men and more so today, about the same number today, what is a healthy man? And here, we can see some of those responses. This word cloud shows us that what men understand by a healthy man is most likely to be a strong man. And therein lies some of the issues that we need to explore. The explanations and attributions that we've heard about what accounts for these inequalities in men's health relate to two main things. One is the role of men. The role of men in relation to being a provider, to being a father, and to being a sexual being. And secondly, we've heard a lot of explanations that are relational about men's relation to women. That perhaps what it is, is that women are encouraging men to be under stress. And that is the explanation for their ill health. But we have found some encouraging findings as well. There is an apparent association between age and the likelihood of adopting preventative or protective health behaviors. Younger men are far more likely also to have higher rates of health literacy. They're much more able to access a wide range of health information and be able to use it and appraise it. But across all of the age groups, across all occupations and ethnicities, men are less likely to seek help if they're feeling down if they have problems associated with their sexual health, or they perceive a health issue to transgress what they think are masculine norms. For example, having a rectal examination for prostate cancer. And these are some of the issues that we need to address in our work here with Yui on men's health. And we, so we have a couple of questions that we wanted to ask you, which may perhaps also contribute to the following discussion. If we are framing a public health message for men in Trinidad and Tobago to take better care of their health, what should that message be for the 21st century? And secondly, what do services need to do to reduce gender-based disparities in health? 
and hopefully through our collaboration we'll be able to answer some of those questions. Thank you. Right. I want to introduce one of the facilitators for this evening, Dr. Calvin Morley. He's a Trinidadian and he's an associate professor in nursing research and diversity in care, adult nursing department at the London South Bank University. He has a background in public health and diversity in care. His research focuses on the interplay of gender, culture, ethnicity, and health. He was the guest editor for a special issue of the Journal of Clinical Nursing on LGBTI Health 2017. And he has been an editor for Evidence-Based Nursing Journal, and he has published widely in various nursing journals. He's one of the facilitators this evening, and the second facilitator is Dr. Oscar Noel Ocho, who you all heard bringing greetings this earlier from UE. He has served as a public health servant in the Ministry of Health for 34 years prior to joining UE School of Nursing as a director and senior lecturer. He's a registered nurse, and his research interests encompasses masculinity and health, health policy as health systems, leadership, and management. He's also a talk show host who presents once a month, monthly, on I-95.5. So I want to invite both Dr. Morley and Dr. Ocho to be the facilitators this evening. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming in. Um, really want to say a special thank you to the Office of the Prime Minister, the Permanent Secretary for Health, uh, Yui, your Dean, and our Vice Chancellor back at London South Bank University, Professor David Phoenix, and our Head of School, our Dean, rather, of the Faculty, Professor Warren Turner. We've had a really interesting um, panel discussion, and. Uh, before we go into the questions, and some of the things I noted is, um, you know, um, like father, like son. You know, Professor Hardy told us about like father, like son. Uh, and she says, you know, who do men and boys turn to for help? Who do we turn to when we're in need? And um, we also heard from the other speakers, um, um, this gentleman right here, um, you get up after you fall, and how many men learn to get up, and how do we learn to get up after we fall? How do we, you know, dust the legs and the sand of the legs and you know the scrape and the bruises so we need to look at that um, and also we heard about the overrepresentation of men in certain areas like suicide for example and certain health risk taking behaviors and um, Amilka I really liked um, a city for, for a small man and a big boy and how you go from small man to big boy that's just so interesting in a concept at London South Bank when I go back on the 1st of December I have a conference I'm hosting called The Art of Nursing. And what you say, and Professor Hardy's also very much interested in the art of nursing and healthcare. And that really resonates with us, I'm sure, Sally, you, you agree. And you know, finally, um, you know, walking that mile. That mile is so hard. Sometimes we walk that mile and we don't, we don't realize we've walked it after we've done it. And I think that's what you're talking about. And that, that's really interesting. Um, you never realize you've walked that mile until you've completed it. And it's really important to understand how we use sport to improve mental health and social and physical health. And sports, sport brings a community together. And we saw that when you talked about, Jerome, you know, that football match. It really brought us together as a nation. It crossed all boundaries. And I think it's really important also that we acknowledge sport. But we want to really go into your question and answers and um, this discussion session, and thank you. But I'll just my little recap to remind you, um, you know, some of the, the things we heard our speakers talk about today. Oscar? The reality is we really want to hear from you. Um, and I see we have a lot of support from women activists. And it's nice to know that looking at the agenda for men, and I, I acknowledge Jackie and um, Fulade and Robinson and those women who have been in the trenches. And, and this is not to not give you a voice but so that you are welcome to speak. But the, the issues 
that we want to focus on is listening to the panelists. Where do we go from here? What are some of the issues that we think is going to be critical as we move forward? Because our other colleagues will have some questions to kind of steer us. And so the, the, the floor is open for us to direct our questions to the panelists. And let's see how we can maximize the time. Yes, Donna. <coughs> we have mics. And uh, since it's being taped, we want to maximize that. Yes. So if you speak in the mic. Good afternoon, all. Again, my compliments to the Office of the Prime Minister, Gender and Child Affairs, for this outreach and raising the, the gender bar when we started to deal with many issues. And the only thing I, I, and I mentioned it to the director, that the only thing we are missing now is a proclamation that Trinidad and Tobago recognizes this day. We don't want the UN. If they want to do it, that's them. But 82 countries have already proclaimed November the 19th as International Men's Day. And, and if countries stand up and do it, if the UN want to follow, that's their business. Now, I'm, I'm very pleased I came because P.S. Ramdeen spoke about sport, and I agree totally. I live in a community where we have a basketball court. Before I became an architect, I designed that basketball court. I didn't put down a church. I didn't put down food outlets. I didn't put down a casino. I didn't put down space for people to have extra garage. The sports company, and I believe you, Mr. Pierce, will know, they came and put down a basketball court and male and female toilets and a cafe. When I come out with my grandson, he had a tutu on the ground because the male basketball court is utilized by a barber and his wife as a salon. The female is utilized as a pool hall. So everybody who have to come, either pee on the ground or go home and tutu. That is, that is how the misuse and the abuse of this valuable opportunity of sport is happening. And I believe it is happening in a lot of communities. As well as we have fantastic facilities. It ain't going on in Brianara Stadium and it's going on in the communities where you have the courts. And I hear with my grandson playing and the fellas have a lamp post there. And they're dipping in it and selling the marijuana like, like if it's sweetie. Eh? And people want to point at the police. At a, the last police conference in Diego Martin, I say, I don't point at the police first. What did the housing corporation do to volunteer the development of, of their, their area? What are the other institutions? Now, the regional corporation, yes, you could point your finger at them. But what is central government doing? giving regional corporations f funds to manage. So Mr. PS of Sport, please pay some attention to what's happening in communities where the beautiful facilities you have set up are misused and abused and not promoting good men and boys. It's leading them into a life of crime and destruction. Thank you. Just um, highlight that um, I'm not in the Ministry of Sport at SPS anymore. Um, I would have <laughs> started at the Office of Prime Minister at the beginning of October this year, right? But I would have served three and a half years. And what I've realized, and coming from an energy background where there are systems and procedures, right, and going to sports, right, um, a lot of these facilities were not built with a business plan, right? Um, the, the agencies like NIPDEC and, you know, you cut. They can build a building, they can build a road highway, but when looking at the operational aspect in terms of the needs of the users, right, 
the, the cost to maintain and manage these facilities, um, it wasn't really properly done, right? Um, if you look at the, the, these facilities that we build, it's basically fence wrong. Somebody controls the key, right? To get used to it, um, you know, you have to know that person. Otherwise, the, the, the committees can't really, you know, get access to it, right? Even though I may have facilities around my area, some of these facilities I can't even go because, you know, it's controlled by somebody. Um, so so, so get, getting, um, you, you know, the, the young males to come, to come out, um, you know, in the past, when we were growing up, we, we also basically play cricket on the roads. We can't do that now. We can't even ride a bicycle on the road, right? Those simple um, type of physical activities that we, we can't really pursue those things anymore, right? So there, there's a need because in, in the Ministry of Sport, what we do is we build the facilities for the local government and we give it to the local government and they expect it to manage it, right? Um, after that, the Ministry don't have control. You know, they just as a developer for the local government, right? So, um, yes, I agree that there's a need to look at how these facilities are operated, or how they're maintained, because when you look at sports, the contribution of GDP, right? Coming from the energy background, your, your energy sector is making money, but you're also losing money, the liabilities, right? If you're losing more money than actually making, it doesn't make sense, okay? Same thing with sports. Sport is contributing national GDP by mitigating the health costs, right? If we could create a healthy society, we could save $6 billion, okay? If we could channel these youths to come to the youth sport facilities, we could save and retract $6 billion from national security, right? So sports has a fundamental role in, in mitigating liabilities of a state, right? And I, I believe that we, we should channel f um, more money into, into sport so that we could cater the social needs of society. Okay, that's my contribution. One of the things uh, I realize in Trinidad and Tobago, we are very much, and I, I don't like to use this too much, but we are very much bandwagonists. We don't care about sports until someone gets a medal. We don't know who are sportsmen, who are sportswomen are. And um, also, parents don't really push their children into a career of sports. You want your child to be a doctor, a lawyer, a teacher, something like that. But when you hear about sports, we don't see sports um, as a serious, as a viable career. We don't see sports as a multi-billion dollar industry. Jamaica sees it. We don't see it. We talk about we have economic tr um, trials and troubles in this country. Um, let's take sports seriously and see what happens. Greet, greetings, greetings. You hear me? Okay, greetings, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Robert Moultrie. I'm a doctor of health, plural. A doctor of the health of the mind, health of the body, health of relationships, and deal with things that go against those things, which is negative anger and issues. I want to say that I'm very, very impressed with all of the panelists and what they had to contribute today. Um, and I love the fact that we have a young man on and he's doing his thing as a youth and shared woo, some intense stuff of what <clears throat> young men go through uh, in his own way, in his own manner. But I also am very impressed with the adversity. You know, the, it, that is such a, a turning point that people can connect with with uh, Mr. Tyson's uh, words on ad adversity. Um, Dr. Dr. Hutchinson, I need your help on this a little bit. Um, hmm, a few years ago at the Chamber of Commerce, uh, you shared something, I have a good memory, uh, that was uh, very potent that um, there was a, a, a high degree of depression in young men in Trinidad and Tobago and that uh, I don't know if you recall what, what the family structure of most of these young men in Trinidad and Tobago is, is like. Uh, uh, in addition to, uh, we, we, you, you had also talked about the relationship of depression and violence, that now at the, uh, a lot of the psychiatric institutes are recognizing uh, the oneness, the strong connection of depression and violence that actually violence 
Well, if you could, if you, could you know, share your, your thought on that, uh, on, on that relationship. That, that's one thing. And this th to everybody. The next thing, we, I, I have an issue with something I'm just going to call apology. 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 And I think this issue of apology, and I want to say this in the name of Mr. William Latchman, who's no longer with us, Mr. Pastor Anthony Manzuel, who's no longer with us, two men who did a lot of work over the years uh, in, in uh, helping and assisting changing issues with men's mind, health, and what's happening between men and women relationships. Apology is that we often, as I recognize as a local society, do not do very well in addressing issues. The only person that I really heard address very directly issues with, with some people from outside of the country tonight on issues of um, distress that comes from within our own women to men in the country. We have a, it's, 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 been, it's even U.S., it's been different places, but we have a real culture of almost fear of talking about it, apology of wanting to talk about it, um, feeling distressed oftentimes when we do talk about it, not being accepted when we do talk about it, feel uncomfortable and embarrassed when we do talk about it. There's a whole lot of issues that I think affect all of these things, affect our mental health, thus affect our physical health, affect our anger health, affect our relationship health, that uh, when we have these types of forms, that I think it's more healthy to be able to also discuss some of those things, put them on the table, not just um, the men when they're away and they're outside, but why do we have this apology? And not along, not, uh, along with that apology, to, to not make people feel comfortable who do talk about it. Now, I've noticed this. I've been dealing with this work for over 20 years here in Trinidad and Tobago, and I'm very, very fascinated by it. But I find it uh, as a paucity of, um, of success. Uh, if, you could, if you could, you know, doctor, well, let me just say that there's a relationship between uh, depression, negative thinking, and let's say something like cancer. Years ago, the cancer rate was 111. Depression rate was 111. Went up to one in nine. Cancer rate was one in nine. Depression rate one in seven. Cancer rate one in seven. Depression rate, somebody said one in three. Okay, well, the, the, the cancer rate recently one in four. Uh, uh, that was before, I think it's even higher now. If we don't address some of these things, we're gonna have some issues. Okay. I, I just wanted to see if, for the sake of the panelists, since you, you spoke about apology, if you could translate that into a question so that they could better conceptualize what, you, what you're trying to get at. Okay. Uh, I don't know if anybody doesn't understand, but uh, let me see if I can break that some down a little bit. Um, uh, sometimes we feel that they're victims of vindictiveness, husbands and wives, that if a husband speaks out about some issues that their wife does, that the wife says, well, I'm not gonna, if you feel that way, I'm not going to give you sex. If you feel that way, I'm not going to cook for you. That is at a home level. And then sometimes on, an, uh, on a more international level, uh, some people are not in, um, invited to different places, different forms, different funding that goes on for male groups. Um, male groups, International Men's Day, have been really having some challenges in getting funding from different segments of bodies that want to do some things over the year. So I don't know if that makes it clear. But that's along the lines of what I'm saying. So, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Hutchinson, if you could address that first one, and anybody else can address the, the next section there. Thank you. Did you get the question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the issue of depression and violence, I think that it's, it's complex in the sense that men don't necessarily, or boys don't present as depressed, but their depression is kind of displaced into behavior um, and I think it the, the, the issues that give rise to it really come from that whole issue of expectation versus experience or reality, the reality of the experience um, and their feeling that what is expected of them is somehow uh, detached or distance from their reality um, and I think that the response to that is in some ways instinctively to 
to lash out and also to engage in, in destructive or more destructive behaviors. I think um, Amilka uh, gave a very moving description of that kind of um, experience of, of growing up and, and, and trying to figure out where you fit and how you fit and seeing the society uh, measure you and expect certain things from you and not not being clear as to how how you should respond to it. And I think to partially deal with the second question, I think one of the other issues we have, again, it's complex because um, I think we've probably not fully recognized how much boys are abused um, in, in multiple ways. I think we've not fully acknowledged how sometimes mothers in suggesting that their their sons are very much like their fathers and are not worth very much how they undermine a boy's confidence, but also his sense of what a man should be. And I think that um, the, the uh, difficulties with, with expressing vulnerability and expressing uncertainty, I think, lead to a lot of, of psychological distress, which expresses itself as um, atypical or antisocial or inappropriate behavior. Is there anybody else on the panel? Um, before we go to the next question, for, for me it's really interesting. Uh, the culture and society I now live in, um, women have a lot of responsibility with child rearing and development. And over the last couple of days, what I've heard in Trinidad coming out is that here women are almost seem to be blamed for when something goes wrong with a young child. And that's probably something you need to look at probably within parenting and the value of women in the home. Because where I, where I live now, what I consider part of my culture is, you know, we really much appreciate women and, how, and what they do with child rearing and development. And, and here I heard you almost say, you know, the woman re projects almost that negative experience of the father onto the child. And you probably really need, there's probably a pathology around that and you really need to look at how that is embraced and what we do, because that's some way of looking going forward. I think that's interesting for our conversation. Um, part of my thesis work help expose, I, I, I mean, it's not, it's not new or anything, but it's fairly interesting about the confusion that comes around with gender equality. So as women have entered into the sphere of more visible positions of public authority and leadership, the young boys in my focus groups, they reject that. But they have had such adverse experiences with other male figures of authority, it's like twice the rejection when a woman now occupies that power. So they may have had very abusive relationships with a school principal seen as a headmaster, but naturally male. A man could beat and command the authority, discipline and respect. But worse yet, when the headmaster have on a high heels and you want to, what, you can't beat me like a man. So these young boys, I mean, these are university young men who say that if the principal and vice principal was a woman, that was the worst period in their school time because they couldn't control a boy's school. So it's interesting with gender equality, men now revert oftentimes to an order that they prefer and know, which is the man should be the head. And therefore, when women seem to be like in charge, they're not really in charge, it's the few we see in, but when they're there, the structure and the authority and the leadership and the disconnect still there in a big way. So the structure didn't change, even though the face of the gender may have. And I find that very interesting and the confusion at the time. There's a microphone just there, so if you want to move to that, thank you. Hi, good night. <clears throat> I, I have a deep concern. Well, I, I'm not asking this question based on who I represent here. I work for Information Division. But I'm asking this based on, um, I work for I have a, a company called Spirit of Vibe Gospel Music Magazine. And one of my burden, burden for a while now is, um, this thing they call them bipolar. Um, I'm seeing it and hearing it more often now, <coughs> and I understand that it's been around for a while. 
Um, outside of that, I have two friends who were married. No, one is married and one is single. And part of the reason I know one is single is because people know him to be bipolar. A very handsome young man, educated, talented, but he seemed to have a problem having a relationship. Right? Um, um, the other guy was married to someone, and the woman left him because of his bipolar issues. And the other question is, um, why so much men are mentally ill? Uh, I see, um, and you might ask that question, well, what happened to he? Well, he woman leave him, he was involved in a relationship, X, Y, and Z, and I'm asking him because my father was mentally ill, he's deceased now. And um, what... What causes mental illness in men so often or so much? And what can, we, can, what can we do to help heal our broken brothers? Thank you. So, Professor Hardy, you want to? You want to I, I think we're coming to both of you, really. <laughs> there are five major theories that help us to understand what mental illness is and how then a path of treatment can be determined. One of them is a social construct of mental illness or madness. Another is a biological genetic mechanisms where things go wrong. There are the primary relationships, a psychoanalytical approach. So there are different theories that we've tried to continue to understand where madness comes from and what and how it develops in people. Probably around the world that we're seeing a lot of words being introduced into cultures where there haven't been words before has followed um, medication and the medicalization and the pharmacology world. Um, in China, for example, people weren't talking about depression until the antidepressants arrived on their doorstep. So there are many facets, and you know, for me it's a, a fascinating area of work, and we're learning more and more about the brain. It's the brain and the womb that are the two most under-researched and under, um, we, we know least about those two organs in the body. Um, and then your other question, you know, where, what is mental health, but what do we do about it? I truly believe that people heal. People are able to heal, and it's when people come together. We as human beings crave relationship, and male and female is potentially, you could argue, the yin and the yang, the, you know, the soulmates idea. But that is being challenged, as we've said, in terms of seeing a gender fluidity now. In, in a postmodern, in a contemporary world. And people are still struggling to understand who am I and how do I relate with others. So that, to me, is fundamentally what mental health is, understanding self and how I then am able to relate to others. There's a saying, you know, traveling over here on the aeroplane, they say, make sure you put your oxygen mask on first before you can help others. It's the same in mental health issues. If you are yourself under stress, or you're really tired, or you're worried about something, you're less likely to be able to be there and to help someone else. In Trinidad, that might be your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think um, it's it's the 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 I don't know if we know the answer to the question regarding you know, why so many meals? Um, I think the mental health really is a kind of, um, it, it, it mirrors the society. Social problems, I think, lead to mental problems. And, and I think that's a two-way relationship. 
So um, depression, for example, has become extremely topical. Everybody is talking about depression, and I think that's partly because it's it's. I think of it almost like the 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 uh, the disease of contemporary civilization that people are struggling to cope with the rapid changes. We talk. We've been talking about all the gender issues, all all the things that take place. Um, I think, of course, that kind of um, difficulty in us understanding where we are in the world um, and, and what we are to do in the world. And I think for men, that, that challenge is, is more profound. And um, because they've, they've, historically, their role was pretty, was, 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 was pretty clear, was pretty well-defined. No, that has become a lot less um, clear and a lot less um, the, the, the measure of performance or the measure of success is, is, is very different. And I remember, for example, um, going back to the point about um, other societies, like when seeing what, what was called then, which is about 15 years, 15, 20 years ago, house husbands. In, in Britain, and thinking that was, was a very alien concept, where the woman was out working, but the man was home taking care of the children, taking care of the household. And I think for us here, those kinds of things are very difficult to, to come to terms with. And because our family structure, and, if, and I guess this is what Robert was referring to, many of the the, the cases of mental illness come from um, broken families or families where the, the, the presence of, of um, men is, is either um, transitory or um, certainly inconsistent, even when they, they, they're present as husbands in, in the household. Um, and again, as Amelka was saying just now, the, the, the role of the, the man in that context was to discipline or to punish, or in some instances to abuse. So it, I think it has led to a lot of confusion as to um, how, do I, how do I express myself. And I think when you add that to the use of substances, excessively, when you add that to the, the, the issue of the demands of education and the demands of society for, for them to conform, I think it's, 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 it's one of the things that, that leads to, to mental illness. And of course, the, a lot of the people you see on the street, like you say, are men and homelessness is far more common in men um, than it is in, in women. And I think, again, it's that thing about um, the society not thinking that men need to be cared for. Um, they, they, they need to, to kind of care for themselves. And if they can't, well, tough. So, um, so I think that, that, is, that is where the, 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 the challenge lies. Yeah, I'll just add shortly. Um, when I think about mental health, I think the first thing like I try to explain to my friends is like, virgin, this like a cough, like I have a cough now, that doesn't mean I'm perpetually sick. You know, mental health is something when your mind just needs some help, you know, and you can breathe and take it out. And that kind of put into context to help challenge the stigma around it, you know, and identify it as a mental illness. Um, our next thing is, you know, these issues are topical and they present a challenge for both men and women, you know, and sometimes they're very unequal because there's a power relation, somebody had more control, someone said the terms of it. But, you know, something that's always been interesting that, and I'll put it out here, is when young men come to me when women have abortions and they didn't have a say. And I find that it's interesting because it's like the last domain where women have control and it's her belly, you know, and she get the money and go by the doctor. You know, where you call the police or something, you know. So I found out so interesting, men feel ultimately powerless. 
in the decision of the life of a child sometimes when she says like, yo, I don't think you should be the father, or I don't want to be bound to you in this kind of way. And I've seen fellas plunge into a great depression there. And they didn't have the friends and the community available to give them a language that was productive and not to be as violent, not to shame somebody. Somebody's like, yo, okay, you get horn. Yeah, people just get horn. It hurts. But you don't have to be shaming anybody. You don't carry it out on Facebook. You don't need to take it up in the court. You know, some they have to explain child maintenance. A lot of men don't pay child maintenance because they think their wife spite them, and that is the way that they resist them. And they ignore how child maintenance is a decision made by the courts about what is determined to be paid for on the maintenance of the child. So there's a long way we have to have these conversations, and it's tied to the idea of pale masculinity, which I think is unique in some ways for men. It's like a masculine capital. The more manly things we do and present ourselves as, you get like man points. And that means you have this kind of male currency and dollars in your pocket. So people know their worth in this market of men. You know when you're a poorer man or a richer man, a big man or a small man. You go on the block now, I see little man out there, all I know nine feet, little man. Right? You know, no little man is six foot four. But he's talking about his position in the economy, position and status in the society. And it's about achieving being a man. So when most men can't occupy those status, they didn't go to the prestige school or work in the energy sector, what happens is that they feel they are failed and they assert their power in other ways, which is sometimes through violence or desire for control. And once upon a time, manhood was something like the ocean. It was just there in the water. But now with these changes in the economy and women moving to more positions of power, we need to ask very much more difficult questions about who we are. We can't take it for granted and should not. But I think this, this raises a very, very important and interesting um, issue. And I, I know your hand was up a while. Because even in my research, what, what was interesting is that the men said, if, when you see a female, you know that's a woman. Nobody questions that she is not female. But when you see a man, he has to constantly be constructing, deconstructing, and reconstructing this thing. Because from an economic standpoint, are you a man or are you a boy? Yeah? From a social perspective, everybody again now getting somebody to hold on to. You have a number of women as your companions. You could go by this one tonight, that one tomorrow night. But nobody is looking in your direction. Are you a real man or are you a macrome man? And and so the male has to be constantly reconstructing because we don't take it for granted, even among us as men, that a man is a man. So we have the soft man, we have the mama pool man, we have all these different things, and he is constantly trying to, to say, but who am I? So that mental challenge he has to, to, to be creating in his own mental space, and even when he shares it with another man, he laughs. You else should be your else stupid man. So at what point then will he find some kind of solace and foundation to be clear about what it is to be a man to him? And this conversation to my mind is extremely important. That we will have to constantly keep it going because it's so important. Oh, don't get too excited. <laughs> yes, yeah, I about that. Um, the question you asked from just now, recently I was traveling on a taxi, and um, I have to tell the people in the car, I can't afford a relationship right now. Um, and it seems like a weird thing for a working man to say in a government job. But women today are saying, who may not be as financially secure as you're saying, listen, when you come into me and tell me you love me, what you come in with? Can you afford to, if you don't have your own house and you don't have your land, right? So you have to pay rent. She may have a child or may not have a child. Her salary is what? A thousand dollars a week or 750 a week. So you like this beautiful black woman or Eastern woman, whoever the woman is. 
What are you bringing to the table? Can you afford to help her? You have two children to take care of as well. And one of the reality now is that can we financially sustain ourselves, maintain our children, and take care of a woman on our side? So are we financially stable? Or is our economy financially stable to help the men who want to progress in life? And a man who wants to elevate himself from, from 3,500 a month to go to the next level, he wants to have a family, but he can't afford a family. And these are some of the issues we are going to be facing in the future. Are we financially stable as men to take care of ourselves and for more to take care of our family? I, I wonder how much, and I'm looking at the panel as well and everyone else in the audience, I wonder how much it is about in our change of mindset of what masculinity and being a man is. Because we seem to still have this notion that the man will be the provider. You'll be doing everything. And when you enter a relationship, in my experience, it's two of you and it's shared. And there isn't this, probably most people have a vetting system in their head, you know. You must be working, you must be doing this and that. But, which is fine for individuals' vetting purposes. But I think our whole national mindset of, you know, what masculinity is and how you enter relationships needs to be looked at closer. The whole issue of masculinity as performance, how yeah. you perform this. How you perform as a man. Because yes. you could be better together rather than just waiting on your own for somebody. Yes. Yeah. Gentlemen. And, and we'll take you next. And I think those will be the last two. Uh, go ahead, sir. Okay, afternoon, everybody. Uh, I was just wondering if anyone on the panel uh, conducted any studies um, recently or maybe in the distant past to show the, the connection between uh, workplace injustice and the depression that maybe men or women both might, might, uh, might experience in the long term. Uh, and and um, on top of that, and I'm speaking from the standpoint of, of individuals who may have uh, attempted to address injustices in the workplace and um, have, their, have their behavior be recorded as, their assertive behavior be recorded as quote unquote madness, <laughs> you know. Um, that assertive attempt at re responding to the injustice, especially on the part of males, okay, who, uh, you know, either in reality or in perception, believe that they have been mistreated. Okay, can oh, we just clarify, when you say injustice, you're talking about social injustice, are you? Workplace injustice. Workplace injustice. Workplace injustice. Okay. Um, who on the panel would like to start? <laughs> I mean, I if, okay. if, if I share my own... Yeah, by, by, by either by employers or by their, their yeah. peers, you know, yeah. uh, maybe, the, maybe, maybe your peers are getting support yeah. from the, the employer, the higher-ups. Yeah. Maybe it's, you know, I'm not trying to sound conspiratorial this afternoon. Well, well I could share my own experience, um, having returned um, qualified and being denied a position um, in the ministry that I worked in. And it was quite interesting that people were saying, boy, don't do that, they will embarrass you. You can embarrass yourself. And I felt strongly enough to take my case to the Equal Opportunities Commission that is going to the tribunal. And when my colleagues recognized that I was resolute, the level of respect I gained from them, in fact, one who was trying to distract me because she was fearful that I'd be victimized, she said, I'm glad you're doing it because I myself am tired of seeing it. But very often we suffer in silence because of the fear of the unknown or the perception that if we act on it, somebody will continue to press the button. And, and I think one of the things we have to do is to empower people to recognize that you have a choice in determining how you will allow people to treat you. Well said, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just going to highlight, um, I had personal experience in workplace injustice uh, back in the Ministry of Energy when they decided to do a restructuring. They did a phase one, but they didn't do the phase two. Um, um, part of the division, which was the operations section back then, had a director. I was the chief, right? And how it was structured, the mechanicals would do the upstream sector and the chemicals would do the downstream sector. Uh, when they restructured, basically, they took upstream and downstream and gave it to the mechanical. 
and then they move out the director and then they put me to act as the head so I had my workload went from 100 percent to, to, to 300 percent right and over that 10 years we, we you know you're, you're basically writing the, the various agencies to find out what's happening you know the, you're doing the work of a director you're not getting paid you have to put out all this work then your family um, realizing that you you're not giving the time right you have to work on Saturdays and Sundays to just make up all of this, um, you know, just to, to cover for the operation. And uh, a lot of uh, officers within the ministry also got unfairly mistreated. They were sidelined, you know, because suddenly you have to be finding y y yourself acting in a higher post, doing the work with director, and not getting paid. And I think that's one of the major grouse right now uh, at that ministry, right? So um, I, I, I took it for 10 years, but then I wrote the exam, I passed DPS and I left the system, you know, with, with no redress, you know, still unpaid for that period. But it was, it was stressful, and the system really don't compensate and give you that redress, you know. Yes, sir. Thank you. We're going to go ahead, sir. Right. My name is Kelvin Mapp. I think we have ventilated the issues very well from the panel and from the discussions. I think we don't up, I think we are down to bottom line. What is the new definition of meal that is going to be applied to the 21st century? Somebody has to take that responsibility and come up with that definition. Otherwise, you have nothing to tell the young men. Nothing. You have nothing to tell the older men. And though we have ventilated the issues that have come out of a fail or lapse definition, and the mental health, the sport. Oh, well, that's quite fine. But in the end, somebody has got to tell those young boys what it is to be a male. Is academia going to switch? How much research are we going to do before we come up with a definition? Is the Ministry of Gender going to do it? Who is going to take the bull by the horns and say in the 21st century, this is what it is, young fella, this is what it is to be a male? Because somebody has to do it. You can do the research. You can tell us all the effects. You can give us all the side effects, social, mental, whatever, economic, whatever. But in the end, somebody has got to put it down in black and white and explain it to the young boys on the street what it is to be a male. And somebody has to take their responsibility. What, okay. if, what if what? I throw that question back to you? Sorry? Who do you see? as a man, just from your perspective. And that's a classic academical approach. I like it, but I'm not going to succumb to okay, it. Because the question is, who is going to take the responsibility? Okay, so and, 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 I, and I'm just, I myself am Charles Academia. If you're doing the research, if you're coming up with the side effects, if you understand, then you must be one of the people in the position to give us a new definition. There's no point telling us all the side effects. And we don't have a definition to book up. We don't have a definition to pass on to anybody. Okay, so and that's the bottom line at the end. Thank, thank you for that. And now there are two things, or three things. I know there's Professor Wills wants to have a say and, and the PS. Um, but we belong to the sector of applied research. Is that what you're going to talk about today? to put it right down, being very sure. To follow from the gentleman's uh, question about the definition, it's a, the first question is, do we actually need a definition of what it is to be a man? Because we could simply take what is the, uh, the um, slogan of London South Bank University, which is, become what you want to be. And we need to think about, in every country, not just this country, but every country, what are the values that underpin the country? In most countries in the world, we talk about responsibility and we talk about choice. That's what's happened in the 21st century. And you, you and we, all of us, need to be thinking about, is that what we mean by being a man or being a woman? I just want to add one little thing, which is a personal comment, that I've been very struck in the last few days about the way in which gender is expressed here, one, 
in relation to the other. So we've, it's International Men's Day, but a lot of the conversation is about the role of women and not about the role of men independent of women. Women do not cause men's ill health. And I think it's very important that we hold on to that, especially those women in the room here too. In relation to our research, I did pose two questions. I'd be very glad to hear a response to those, one of which follows from the previous question, which is, what should we do to change concepts of masculinity to reduce the gender disparities? What should services do and what should policy do? Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I'm here. Thank you. Um, several things have emerged here today. Um, very exciting discussion. Uh, I want to make two statements. Um, the gentleman asked who. I believe that government has a major role to play as a partner in changing the role of men and, and maybe even uh, defining that. Um, what is the what is the, the, the new role of a man? That has to be determined, not by government. That has to be determined based on collaboration between, among men, NGOs, academia, before we just go there, we go out there and just create a, a, a new role or define what, 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 is, what is the role of a man or what is a man. Um, and that has to be based on, on, on sound research. Um, one of the things that we don't have here in Trinidad is sound research that would lead to sound decision making, sound policies, sound strategies that we can use to, to take us to where we want in 2030. And we, we'll be looking at gender equity and gender equality by 2030. So there's a, we, we know we have a role to play, the government has a role to play, but we also know that there are other Stake, stakeholders in, 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 in the system who we need to, need to engage in order to, to, to get us to where we, we, we want, whether it's a definition of men, uh, but th that whole big picture of gender equality is what, what we have to treat with. The second thing is that we talked a lot about moving the, the boy from childhood. Uh, and we, we know a, lo a lot about the status of the, 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 the boy, men sort of dynamics. The, the, the concern for us is what are those strategies <coughs> that will allow us to treat with the issues we've spoken about here today with regard to men and boys. Um, in my view, we have some, uh, the, 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 the women and the girls, while there's clear discrimination there, and we need, know we need to address the discrimination there, um, <coughs> We need to also look at what is happening to the men. Um, there's some chaos we're seeing inside of there with the young, the young population, the young children, and we are clearly seeing some of the chaos among the men, the mental health issues among men. Um, why m many of them are on the streets? Uh, um, um, why we have so many fatherless children? What is the role there for the men as, as, as parents? Um, why are they performing so badly, well, academically? Um, what are the strategies? And we need to get to the point where we have to look at the strategies or define the strategies to treat with the issues affecting men in the country. Very often, we, we say gender is about women. Oh, it's, and you hear it when you do a process about well, them, them women again, going down into the vernacular. Mm -hmm. um, but gender is not about women. It's, it's, it's about men and women in that social context. So we cannot say we're looking at women only. We must look at men. I, I keep saying that, you know, you look at the, the data and the statistics in, in other countries. We, we were trying to follow a, a formula in, in, in um, Colombia recently. And we, we, when we looked at the, 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 the status of women there, compared to our women. It, it's so different. 
and, and there was so much modification we had to do to the, the model itself to make it applicable to Trinidad that you, 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 you find yourself in a position where you say, listen, we, we, we can't implant, we just simply can't implant or the relationship between men and, wom the men and women here and there is two totally different things. So we really need to start looking at those strategies that will take us from, that would allow us to, 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 to have the man or the, the men that we want or, or that we are looking for as adults and we need to start with those boys looking at where we see the gaps. A lot of it has to do with the parenting and how we socialize our boys in, 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 in this modern society. How we teach them, you know, how the education system is or is not serving any purpose with, 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 with those young boys. Yeah, a lot of things has, must be done. The research has to guide that. We have, we have some, we know we, we have some basic information that could build a strategy, but we need to build on those and create what we want that reflects our specific needs, uh, the needs of the, the, the male community in Trinidad and Tobago. Oh, thank you very much. And I think um, for us the last few days, and in, you know, I'm talking on behalf of my colleagues as well here, um, you know, they normally say men don't like talking, but we found the men we've met and spoken to even today, we were on Harris Promenade in San Fernando, and when we were doing the questionnaires, which we're gonna ask all the men in the room to fill out for us if you haven't done so yet, or filled one in previously, um, we realized the men have a story to tell. And it's by listening to that story becomes the data you're talking about as well. And once we hear that voice, what was given that voice to men, then we can start again gathering that data, that form of data gathering, to build this strategy and develop it. And I think it's really important that we listen to what the men are saying, because they want to talk to us, they're not hiding anymore, which is really good, I think. I, and we at London South Bank, you know, as I alluded to earlier on, um, just to answer the last gentleman's question, we have a center for applied research, and it's applied because we want to make a difference in the lives of people. It's not just doing the academic research, but it's, like you said, developing the strategy. How do we implement it afterwards and make sure it works? Don't go and, you know, thief somebody else's model or copy it. Build your own, and then you know it's going to work for you from your own blueprint. Oscar, I think we're about closing. Yeah. I, I think this, this is very rich, and, and please don't lose hope. Uh, the reason why this collaboration has been established the way it has been established with the coming together of London South Bank University and the Office of the Prime Minister and the way the program would have developed over the last two days was to ensure that as we capture this information, it sets the foundation now for us to build on some of those recommendations there would be areas where we may have to get some more research data to inform the way forward. But I think we have also, from the, from the men, heard a lot of information that, that we were able to identify some low-hanging fruits that could now be transformed almost immediately into some programmatic action uh, to ensure that the, your contribution and your voice um, is not lost. And, and chances are, maybe it, this discussion will have to move beyond just coming up with a definition of who we want this man to be, but an understanding of what are those common threads that will make us human as men and at the same time, keep us whole. Thank you. Going back to Julian? Are you handing back to Julian? What an interesting and thought-invoking and provoking discussion we had here this evening. Although the session has come to an end, I must say that the work continues. One of the things I, I wanted to share, you know, there were a lot of pertinent issues raised, and you know, it made me reflect on being a, a young father at a point in time. 
and having to, because to sort of address what the gentleman asked. It was a challenge of, you know, trying to create a definition to teach my son of what it means to be a man. And early on I realized masculinity as performative is dangerous because in essence it would mean that I would teach my son if he's not able to perform or i.e. feel he's less of a man. So I think that we need to continue discussion and as the permanent secretary said, understand that gender is not he against she or we against them. But gender speaks to issues affecting both men and women and boys and girls. So I'd like to extend a special thanks to our collaborators, the London South Bank University and the University of the West Indies, each member of the panel, Professor Sally Hardy, Mr. Kern Tyson, Mr. Amilkar Sanatan, Permanent Secretary Ian Ramdahin, Dr. Gerald Hutchinson, members of the audience, CNMG for the media coverage, other media houses, key stakeholders who are with us today as well, and staff at the OPM. I would also like to take the time to share that the Office of the Prime Minister starts the commemoration of 16 days of activism on Friday, the 25th of November, 2017, with the International Day for, for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. And the observance will be celebrated with a outreach at Citygate Port of Spain from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So for those of us who are passing through Citygate at a time, I want to encourage you all to support, come out, bring your co-workers, because it is a we. It is us. And I'm using the vernacular. It's not grammatically correct, but it is we and us and not I. And all of these activities, initiatives, yes, some of us may feel at times that it's not talk, but we need the conversation to begin, to hear and share concerns, ideas, as well as possible strategies. So again, I say thank you on behalf of the Office of the Prime Minister, Gender Affairs. I bid you farewell, a safe evening, and happy International Men's Day. Good evening.